Welcome everyone to this very special event, Shavasar B'Tamah's event. We had Rabbi uh, David Ashir last year, and Baruch Hashem, the Rabbi is joining us again this year for so we can not only go through the fast, but we can grow through the fast and um, and take the messages from the fast and and uh, really capitalize on it. It's being presented by the Chazak Organization, Beth Gavriel Community Center. I want to thank Beth Gavriel Community Center for partnering together on this very special program, as well as the tremendous programs they do throughout the entire week. They have a night call, El Minyanim, throughout the entire day and night. Um, and um, everyone who's, who's, who's watching right now, please encourage your friends, or anyone watching right now, please encourage you to come in person right here to Beth Gavriel Community Center, 6635 108th Street in Forest Hills, 6635 100 A Street in Forest Hills. If anyone, for whatever reason, can't make it in person, they can watch on tornytime.com slash Kazak Live, or they can call in over the phone at 718-298-2077, extension 46. Again, 718-298-2077, extension 46, or on tornytime.com slash Kazak Live. Um, following the rabbi's lecture at, um, at 7.45 p.m., we minchah right in this room right here. Um, and just a quick word about the Chazak organization. Chazak organized amazing shirim of, and lectures and events in person and, uh, and virtually, which inspired thousands of people throughout the entire world over the year. And Chazak's main mishtab or, is, is organizing and, and educating Jewish public school students through after school and Sunday school programs in over 15 different locations. And with the ultimate goal of hopefully helping them transfer from public school yeshiva. In the last five years alone, has up transferred over 1,200 children from public school yeshiva. Someone who has someone who has children in public school like to um, transfer transfer to yeshiva or like an after school Sunday school program for them. Reach out to Chazak, and it is a great, great schus honor to call upon Rav David Ashir Shlita. Thank you, Rabbi. Chazak Baruch for all the tremendous work that Chazak does. Hashem should give you the strength to continue with all your avodat kodesh. The main goal of every ta'anit is to grow, to become closer to Hashem, to make teshuvah. And as we begin this three weeks period, we're supposed to begin the fast this day with Kabbalot, what are we doing better, how are we going to improve the Vilna Gaon writes, he says, after a person leaves this world, when they are shown what they could have accomplished, and that that they realize now that they no longer have the ability to do, they can no longer choose between right and wrong, he says the regret that a person will have at that time is going to be so strong that even if a millionth of that type of pain would have existed while he was alive, miyad met, he would have died right away from that. Which means the regret of what we could have accomplished, what we could have done, is going to be so intense, but it doesn't have to be that way. We know in advance. We know there's going to be a day. We know there's a day of reckoning. We know how much potential Hashem gave us. It says if someone would look into the Shamayim and see at the time of a sin what the damage that take, that's taking place in his Nishama, in the, all the Olamot in Shamayim, all of the negative effects of one Avon, there's no way we would ever sin. It's not worth it. Look at all the damage. Look at all the, what's necessary to take place after that sin, all the kapara, everything that has to happen. If we would only see, we would never sin. If we would see the value of a mitzvah, we would never stop chasing the mitzvot. If we would know how much potential we had, if people wouldn't be so down on themselves, ah, not for me, I'm just a beginner, I'm just this. If we would know we have a piece of Hashem inside of us. Imagine there was a man who spent his life walking around the streets like a bum with a shopping cart. And he's sleeping on the benches. And he smells. And someone comes over to him. He's in his 70s. They tell him, He's now almost turning 80. 
They said, I was looking for you my whole life. I couldn't find you. What do you want from me? He said, you know, your father told me to find you. He left you a billion dollars. What? A b I worked my whole life. I'm a bum. And I had a billion dollars? What kind of regret? The life he could have lived. That's what every person's going to be told. You know what you had inside of you? You had a piece of Hashem. Your father invested so much in you. It says, Adam la amal yulad. Man is created to toil. We're here to accomplish. We only feel good when we accomplish. And there's nothing that could stop us if we just had the will. How much do we love accomplishing? I was listening to a class on Shalom Bayit. Forgot the name of the rabbi. It was playing in the car. I was with somebody. And he was talking about accomplishment. And he mentioned, he said something that's very eye-opening. He said, you could have a Ben who's a multi-millionaire. He has hundreds of millions of dollars. He could live comfortably for 20 lifetimes. But yet, he works and he works and he works and he'll work till late hours and he'll... And you say, what? why don't you just relax? Lie down on the beach, enjoy yourself, sit by the pool. You don't need the money. What's the answer? What is he working for? What, his children? There's enough for his children. His grandchildren? There's enough. What are you working for? And the rabbi said, you know what the answer is? The answer is that he feels more accomplished in earning another million dollars than he does sitting by the pool. Doesn't do it for him. What you, what's the end goal? You have so much money, now you can relax. Relax. You sit there for an, a day, a two, a week, two weeks. It's boring. Now what? What do we do? Man is not created to lie down and relax. That's not what we are. You're going to get bored. That's why people who win the lottery, they go crazy. Because what are they? There's nothing. There's no accomplishment. But the man gets more sipuk. He gets more enjoyment out of getting another deal. Got another. He conquered another deal. He got it. We get satisfaction through accomplishment. It's in our DNA. But says Chazal, Everybody's toiling. Everybody's got to toil. You can't live otherwise. But fortunate is the one who puts all his investments in Torah. He gets his accomplishment in another chesed, and another day of learning, and another day of helping. This is where we should get our sipuk. Because this is what life's all about. And we don't want to have regret. What I could have done, what I should have done. There's a midrash. The midrash says, When Reuven saw what's written about him in the Torah, when he saved Yosef, it says, he said, if I would have known what's going to say about me that I saved Yosef, I would have put him on my shoulders and carried him back to my father rather than just taking him out. It says, when Aharon Kohen found out, it said in the Torah, when he met Moshe Rabbeinu after he was told that he's going to be the leader and Aharon was happy, it says, V'samach boy he was happy in his heart. He said, if I knew it was going to say that, if I knew that's what's going to be, I would have came out with bells. I would have came out with instruments to greet Moshe. And it says by Boaz, it says he fed, he gave root to eat some uh, toasted kernels. He said, if I would have known, I would have given her fattened geese or fattened calves or something. I would have given her much better. And the Mefarshah, the Midrash, what, 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 what are these, what are they saying? What, if it would have been publicized, they would have done it better? Do you think they care about the honor? So I saw one explanation. They were saying, if I would have known what's going to come out of this deed, if I knew the ripple effects 
of what my deed is going to produce, I would have done it a million times better. Reuven said, if I knew I was saving Klal Yisrael, Yosef, by saving him, he became the viceroy and he gave us a place in Mitzrayim. If I knew I was a piece of history with this act, I would have done it much better. Aaron Cohen said, I didn't know. Me being happy for Moshe was only, is what Moshe needed in order for him to accept the job. I didn't know that. If I knew is all dependent on me, that he's going to be the leader of Klal Yisrael, I would have done it much better. I didn't know the ramifications of my act. Boaz says, if I knew I was dealing with producing Mashiach here, I would have done it better. The value of our deeds, how far-reaching they are, if we knew what we were accomplishing, that's when we say, oh, we would have done it better. I didn't know what I was doing. One of the things we're mourning today on Shiva Asar B'Tamuz, besides for the famous reason of they breached the walls, but the first thing that happened in history on this day was that Moshe Rabbeinu came down from Har Sinai and he saw the Jewish people worshipping the Egel and he smashed the Luchot. What happened on that day that Moshe broke the tablets? It says in Chazal, Amar Abiel Azar, May dikhtiv harut al haluchot, il male lo nishtabru luchot arishonot, lo nishtakaha Torah mi Yisrael. If Moshe didn't break the luchot that day, the Jewish people would never have forgotten any Torah. The first Luchot were the work of God Himself. The second Luchot we got from Moshe. If we would have had the first Luchot, we never would have forgotten any Torah. You know what that means? You know how many mistakes were made in history? Oh, I forgot. I thought. How many things do we learn? We learned last week. Oh, I forgot what it says. I forgot what it is. I don't know. I don't know. How much Torah was lost? because of what happened that day. If the Jewish people would have realized the ramifications of what you are going to lose, they were having fun, they're dancing around the Egel, they thought it was great, and all of a sudden the party's over. You know what you lost? You lost your crowns from Har Sinai. You lost the whole history, the course of history is going to change. Every single generation, the Egel is going to be punished because of what you were doing. We didn't know. If we would have known, oh, it's a piece of gold, we don't care, we wouldn't have done it. We have to realize there's so many ripple effects to our deeds. Tisha B'Av, the, the day of misfortune, the day of tragedy. How did it start from the Miragalim? They came back and they gave the negative report. You think if they would have been told, you, you're going to cause tragedy, millions of lives are going to be lost because of this report, because of this crying. I didn't know. I didn't know I was causing. You know what it could have been that day of Tisha B'Av? Tisha B'Av could have been the day that we were informed of the beauty of Israel. It would have been a day of celebration. We would have gone right in. No exile, no horban. All from one event. The ramifications of, the, of our deeds are so far-reaching. Tests don't just happen. Every single person's test, every moment of the day we're tested. They don't just happen. I saw when the Miragelim, they came and they took the cluster of grapes big cluster of grapes, it says they named the place Eshkol. Because of the Eshkol, because of the cluster which they found there. But the Midrash says, this place was not called Eshkol now. The place was called Eshkol for many, many generations before this. When? It says, we know Abraham had three friends. One of Abraham's friends' name was Eshkol. 
When Hashem told Avraham to get a Birit Milah, Avraham advised with his three friends. And Eshkol, he told them, Avraham, you can't do it. Because all your enemies are going to come. You killed the four, the four kings. They're going to come back now and take revenge. You're going to be in a state of, 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 of you're be incapacitated. You can't do it. He was trying to tell Abraham to defy the word of Hashem. But Abraham said, of course I'm doing it. That moment in history, there was a Nisayon, Eshkol's Nisayon. Are you going to trust Hashem or are you going to worry about the enemies? That was the time this place was named Eshkol. And now fast forward, generations later, the Miragelim, they go to that place, Eshkol. What's their test? Are we going to trust Hashem? Or are we going to say, oh, what about the enemies, the giants, we can't beat them? The same test came back into play. It didn't just happen, oh, they happened to see that Eshkol. It was all a setup. They were being tested. Like we all are, all times. Hashem tests us. The test He has planned out years in advance. Nothing just happens. We read about, about Bil'am yesterday. Bil'am, the Vilna Gaon says, went through ten tests. Ten tests of Bil'am, like Abraham. The test of Bil'am was, are you going to go curse the Jews against my will? Or are you going to listen to me and not? And Hashem kept sending him obstacles to try to stop him. He the malach, the donkey. You think this should, it looked very natural. There was a war, the Jewish people won. Now the Moab is scared. The Jews beat Sihon and Og. They're scared now. We got to get someone to curse the Jews. It looks very natural. But you know what it says in Chazal? Chazal tell us already on the sixth day of creation at Ben Hashem Ashot, Hashem created the pi ha'aton. What? You're creating the donkey's mouth during the sheva, the seven days of, of Bereshit? You're creating the donkey's mouth? That means Hashem already knows every nisayon that's ever going to take place. He's creating the circumstances for the nisayonot way, way in advance before we're born. And Hashem makes every test is a big test. Everything He does is big. It's nothing little. He created the ram of Abraham, Ben Hashem Ashot, the mouth of the earth that swallowed Korach. All of those tests were put into play while He's creating the world. If we only realized what could be on the line, imagine that day when the daughter of Paro went to the Nile and she saw the basket, little baby Moshe in that basket, imagine if she would have turned away or if she would have said, that's a Jew, we can't help the Jews, we got to kill him. She, that was a test for her. And she put her life on the line. This was her ticket to, to, to Gan Eden. She was one of the old, she's in the highest levels of Gan Eden because she passed that test. She is reaping the rewards for Moshe Rabbeinu. What would a person give to have credit for raising Moshe Rabbeinu? It was a big test for her. Your father's the one that made the decree and you're violating it? But look at the rewards. For all of time, she keeps going higher and higher. It says she's in Gan Eden and every day she's able to look at the image of Moshe Rabbeinu in, with such nachat. Look who I raised. That was me. And she goes higher and higher. To know what's riding on the moment. There's a famous story. It says Yerushalayim was destroyed because of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. Let's go back to the scene. Imagine this man who invites Kamsa to the party. 
And by accident, Bar Kamsa walks in. If this man would have known, you are going to be the cause of the destruction of Yerushalayim. If you don't pass this test, you know what he would have done? He would have got up and say, Bar Kamsa, come sit down. I have, a, I have a chair for you. Here, come eat. I make a plate for you. If he would have known the entire destruction is dependent upon him, what a nisayon. You throw the guy out of the party. It was a big nisayon. He hated him. But you have to know what's on the line. Everything is on the line in our nisayonot. Someone once asked me, Recently, they say, I want to improve. I want to be excited about mitzvot. I want to do them with a, with a gust. I don't want to be dry. How do I do it? What's the secret? The answer is very simple. You have to learn and see the value of what you're doing. If you realize the value, you would be so excited. You'd be running to do it. That's why... The learning of Torah gives us energy. I didn't know. I didn't know that was so important. I didn't know that every moment I hold back from speaking Lashon Hara, I'm going to get a reward that's beyond the comprehension of the Malachim. For every moment. That means I'm about to say it. I say, no, I'm going to hold back. I'm not going to say it. But I want to say it. And you hold back another moment, and another moment, and another moment. And every moment, your account is getting zillions for holding back. I didn't know that. How could I say that? Why did I just say that? I'm sitting at the table. There's 10 people in front of me. I said a nasty comment. They all left. Is it worth it? I could have gotten rewards beyond the comprehension of the angels. I didn't know. But if you learn... You know the value. Every mitzvah is filled with sigulot. Some open the door for childbirth, some for parnasah, some for shiduchim. And those are only the side benefits. A man was asking me, Ah, I do it every day. I put on tefillin. You know, they tell us you're supposed to feel excited like your bar mitzvah. It doesn't happen. I put it on, I take it off. How do I be excited? I said, you know what tefillin are? Imagine you have an antenna that's connected to the Kiddushah of Hashem. Hashem is sending His Kiddushah every day inside of us, into our brains, into our bodies. It says that there are four different compartments we know in the tefillin. Tefillin Shalosh have four compartments. Our brain has four different compartments. Each one of them is running a different part of the body. And our rabbis have found that the part, that the parasha, the bayit that corresponds to that part of the body that's controlling, that's being controlled by the brain, has to do with what ri what's written in the tefillin. You know what that means? Hashem is giving us in our Kedushah that's affecting our whole body with these tefillin. They did a study in the Chinese Journal of Medicine. They wanted to find, they, they wrote that if you want to become more spiritual, you want more spiritual, you have to get acupuncture in certain points of the body. Where are the points of the body to get acupuncture, to become more spiritual and feel more spiritual? The same exact points of the tefillin, here and here. And what do we say every day before we put on tefillin? I am now sanctifying both my machshava, my nishama. We don't need acupuncture. Hashem gave it to us. He told here, here's the formula. Take this box, take this piece of leather. Write these parashiyot on them. Put them in the box. And I'm going to imbue you with Kiddushah. You know what you're getting every morning by putting on these tefillin?
We didn't know. It says, we have a lot of hukim. You're not allowed to shave with a razor. What's wrong with shaving with a razor? It's just a blade. We're taking off a piece of the hair. What's wrong with that? You know what it says in the Zohar HaKadosh? He says the, the hair on the face, the pores on the face is where Hashem gives us His chesed through. We have channels on our face where the chesed of Hashem comes through. And he said if someone takes a razor and he cuts off the hair, he's uprooting the roots of chesed of Hashem. What? I didn't know that. I didn't know. I didn't know the value. Hashem, He shared with us the secrets of the world in the Torah. Follow the Torah. Everything's going to be great for you. You're going to have channels of chesed. You're going to have kedushah. You know all the health benefits of our kashrut and berit milah and mikveh. And all the, the goyim wish they had this. How fortunate we are. I saw something this past year blew me away. There's a sefer called the Magid Mesharim in which Rav Yosef Karo wrote down everything in which the angel that he learned with taught him. He studied Torah with an angel. And the angel who tells him about what's going on in Shamayim Imagine, we can see what's going on in heaven. He's, he has someone from Shamayim learning with him. He wrote, on one night it was Adar Sheni, the 13th of Adar Sheni, Parashat Vayakel. He said, the angel told me the following. He said, that when you go up to Shamayim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to purify you from all of the sins that you had, from the, from the time you were born until the end, they're all going to sink into the ground like lead. And you are going to become so pure. Your neshama is going to come out pristine. And you are going to go to the highest levels of Gan Eden. What a... What news! You're going to the highest levels of Gan Eden. Hashem's going to purify you. What did the Bet Yosef do to get this purification? He says, Because the Rambam was so happy when you revealed what he wrote, when you wrote it in the tour in Siman Kuf Saditet, that no one understood the Rambam until today, you revealed what he meant. And there's other places that you revealed what he meant. And he starts going through them, what the Rambam said in Hafifa and this, and what you wrote about the tour, Emet V'yasiv. And then, you try to answer up a question on the tour over here in this Siman. He says, Hashem was delighted in your efforts, in your pilpul. Samach kudsha berichu behai pilpula. You know how much pleasure Hashem got from you? But you were wrong. That's not what he meant. But these merits of you sitting in your room in front of a book what was he doing? He was sitting in front of a book trying to figure out what the Pshad and the Rambam is. What's Pshad in the Tur? Do you know the value of sitting in front of a book in front of our holy words of Torah? Just trying to decipher them. I didn't know. He's getting atoned for all of his sins because he worked hard. He toiled in Torah. Toiling. Sometimes we're sitting Shabbat afternoon. There's hours and hours of time. And people sit around talking, shooting the breeze. You know the value if you would take out a sefer, open it up, and try to figure out what it's saying. I don't understand. 
It's okay. He was wrong. But Hashem enjoyed the toil. You go to the class. You sit in the class. I don't understand what the rabbi is saying. It's very deep. But you tried. Hashem has so much pleasure from your toil in His book. In this book of Torah. The value of learning is unparalleled. Talmud Torah keneged kulam. And the Vilna Gaon is telling us when we go to the next world, we're say, I wish I had one more shot. What would you do with that extra minute in this world? I'd open the book. I'd try to learn the daf. I'd try to break my head on a Rashi. I would have tried harder. But we have life. We could still do it. You know the value of siniut. It says in the Takanot, the Hadrachot, he writes, anyone who is careful to wear clothing, bihidur, not just to get by. I want to wear clothing, oz vehadar levusha. She wants to do it, bihidur. He says, anyone who's careful to wear clothing, bihidur, and make sure her family does also. She will be zocheh in the future to wear a special garments that have a glow from the light of Hashem that the angels will not be able to look at because of its intense kedusha. The Rebbe from Kaliv once said, I guarantee any woman who dresses like our imahot kedoshot." In the future, Hashem will take every extra ounce of clothing that they were wearing longer. Any extra piece of material, it's going to be put on their scales of merits in Shamayim. And each little piece will have so much weight, it's going to far outweigh, balance the scale in their favor. Wow, one little inch, one little centimeter. I didn't know how important that was to Hashem. I didn't know. But they're telling us, don't regret it later and say, oh, I should have done it. I should have done it. Life is short. The value of accepting the Ratzon Hashem. Many people want to achieve greatness in this world. Some people become great Torah scholars and they disseminate Torah to the masses. Others work tirelessly on behalf of the community. Others donate large sums of money to tzedakah. But some people are not capable. We can't, I'm not a philanthropist, I don't have so much money. I'm not a towering scholar. The Chafetz Chaim writes in his work, Mahane Yisrael, if someone is able to accept the way that Hashem deals with him in life and not complain and not say, why are you doing this to me and it's not fair and how come they have and why does her child get engaged? I'm not... And you accept the Ratzon Hashem. Writes the Chafetz Chaim, Yitromam abur ze madregato me'od me'od. Your level will increase very much and le'atid lavo, your shulchan will be shalem mikol tuv. Just for that, accepting the will of Hashem. I didn't know it was that valuable. Instead of moping around, why is Hashem doing this to me? Why is Hashem doing this? It's not fair. Why? Hashem, I accept. I trust you. How great do you become from these acts? These little acts. Someone told me the other day, she said, she sent an email. She says, I have a friend who's been dating for years and years and years. And it's so hard to see her. I try to help her. I try to make, to be a shadchanit for her. But the years keep going by and the difficulties keep increasing. So she said, before Purim this year, she had a date set up. 
she came back from the date and she says, it was unbelievable, I found him. He was great. I can't wait to go in the next one. But what did Shad Khani tell her? He said that you're very smart, you're very funny, you're very pretty, but he doesn't think it's a match. She was devastated. I can't do this again and again and again. She tells her friend, we'll call her Miriam. She tells Miriam, you know what bothers me the most? I have this interest that no one else has. I never found someone who has it in common with me, but this guy has it. And the conversations flowed so well because we shared this common interest. That's what really bothers me. She says, don't worry, you'll find someone. Okay. A week later, Miriam's father sends her a resume of a man. She's looking at it. She says, I have two friends I always try to set up. What catches me about this man, he's very tall. And I have two friends who are very tall. He's of Ashkenazic descent. One of my friends is Ashkenaz, one is Sfaradi. This Sfaradi is younger than him by four years. The Ashkenaz friend, Ashkenazi friend, same age. It's a no-brainer. I give her with the Ashkenaz friend. But then I saw on the resume, and he loves this hobby. The same interests that my other friend just told me she has. The one who's younger and Sephardic. I said, I have to give it to her. She, she never found any man with this interest. I said, I'm giving it to her. I call her up. I have the best boy for you. She said, nah, I'm not going. He's younger than me. I can't end in another failure. She says, no, you can't pass up an opportunity. It might be the right one. You'll have to push yourself. She pushed herself. She went out with him. And a couple of weeks ago, they got engaged. Baruch Hashem, after all these years. And looking back, Miriam was telling her, that devastating date of yours, that was the worst news. That's the only way I found out you had that hobby and you liked that interest. I didn't know. And one week later, I get a man with that. It was all a setup. Hashem loves you. It was the time. It's hard when we're going through that nisayon, to say, I trust you, Hashem. Oh, that's great. I trust you. This is bad. Very hard. It's very hard. But it's the truth. And if you do it, it will make you great. For people to be able to hope. Someone told me, I can't pray anymore. I can't do it anymore. I can't get my hopes up. It's too hard. Get your hopes up is too hard. It's one of the greatest mitzvot that we have, the sefer mitzvot. Katan writes, having hope in Hashem, salvation, is included in the first mitzvah in the Ten Commandments, Anochi Hashem Elokecha. It's hard. It's hard to get your hopes up. That's what life's all about. Doing Ratzon Hashem, He wants you to hope. But it's been so many years. Everything gets accomplished with your hope. I hope. If you would know the opportunity you had when you got up to pray, you're speaking to the one who controls the world, but we don't think. We just got, I can't do it anymore. You can't do it. Imagine there was a man. He was told by the doctor, Lo Aleno, you have six months to live with this disease that you were diagnosed with. Devastating news. But the doctor said, the, his doctor tells him, there's one doctor in the world who could cure your illness. The problem is, there's a three-year wait to get into him. What is that going to do? I only have six months. And he tries emailing and this and that. 
No shot. He's not getting in. His life's over. He says to himself, I only have six months left to live. I might as well enjoy my final months on this world. He books a trip to some deserted island and he's sitting on the beach in nice Caribbean waters. One day, he sees someone else on this deserted beach sitting somewhat down the, the, the beach. He goes over to look. Who's here? He sees, it's the doctor. The doctor with the three-year wait. He's right there. He goes over to the doctor. Are you doctor so-and-so? Yeah. He says, please, you got to help me. I have a disease. You're the only one in the world who can cure. You got... He says, normally I don't accept people. I have a way. Because you found me over here, I'm going to help you. And he saved his life. Imagine the feelings of this man when he saw that doctor. I found him. The one who could help me. The one person in the world who could help me. I found him. That's how we're supposed to feel every time you get up to pray. I found him. The one person, the one being who could help me. He's right here. I found him. Imagine you had a business deal. You were going to earn a hundred million dollars. You just needed the signature of one more person. Where is he? he? He left. You're looking for the guy. Where's the guy? He's gone. You start making a search party. You hire detectives. The guy, all I need is his signature. hundred million dollars. And for the next couple of years, you're so depressed. I can't believe it. Everything was done. All I need is a signature. And then you're in some place and you walk into some random shtibel. And there he is. He's here. Huh? Is that you? Yeah, could you sign the... How excited. I found him. The key to my paranasa. He's right here. That's how you have to feel. When you get up to pray, I found him. There's no one else. There's only Hashem. Everything we do is so valuable. Hashem appreciates everything we do. Nothing is too small. There was a story. I just heard the other day, man passed away four years ago in Israel. And this man, he left a widow and no children. He couldn't have children. He died Friday afternoon before Shabbat. They didn't have time to bury him. Saturday night, there was another rabbi who passed away and he was brushed to the side. By the time they got around to burying him, it was like 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And they only could find nine people to go. And his widow, no, we need a minyan. We have to find a minyan. My husband. And they walked into a Beit Midrash. Somebody walked in. A Magid, Magid Shi'ur just sat down to start preparing for his Shi'ur at 5 in the morning. He said, please, could you help us? You are the 10th for a burial. He said, okay, I'll do it. They go and they bury this man. After the burial, the wife says, my husband had a last request. Could you help it? What is it? He wants us to sing. He wants you to sing at his funeral. Bar Yochai. The Pizmon, Bar Yochai. Bar Yochai? They all look at each other. Do you know it? Do you know? I don't know it by heart. I don't know. Sorry, we don't know it. She's so distraught. My husband, the only thing he wanted, we have to do it for him. I'm sorry, we don't know it. All of a sudden, that tenth guy that they got, the Magid Shi'ur, the rabbi, he pulls out of his pocket a piece of paper, he unfolds it, he says, I have a copy. They start reading, they sing the song, Bari Yochai. She's so happy. Ah, oh, thank you. By the way, they... What are you doing with this song on you? He says, I don't know. Friday afternoon, I was walking home. I saw a piece of paper on the floor with Hebrew writing. I picked it up to put it in Geniza. 
I put it in my pocket. I forgot to put it in Geniza. I changed it to my Shabbat. Sunday morning, I woke up early. I put these pants back on. And here it is. She said, I can't believe it. You know, my husband, he wasn't such a learned man. He had a very hard life. He didn't have children. But every Shabbat, he managed to sing this song. He loved the song, Bar Yochai. And he would sing it with happiness. And he would put all of his troubles and worries out of his mind and sing every meal. Bar Yochai, Bar Yochai. I used to love watching him. And he asked to sing this song at his funeral. Look at what Hashem did for him. He made his funeral at 5 in the morning when they couldn't get him in Yan. And the tenth man that they were going to find, he set him up on Friday to find a piece of paper on the floor to have in his pocket so he could get that song sang for him. Look at how much Hashem appreciates everything we do. It's all dependent on us. It's a decision. Do you want Hashem or you don't want Him? You have to make that decision. Hashem, I want to live your life. I want to do everything according to your Ratzon. I'll conclude. There's a very famous Midrash. You all know it. But I'm not sure if you know the last line of the Midrash. The Midrash is about a couple who couldn't have children for 10 years and they went to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and he told them, you have to get divorced. Famous Midrash. But he said, it's not a sad time. I want you to celebrate your divorce like you celebrated your wedding. Make a party. And the husband makes a party. He gives his wife the get. And he tells her, my dear wife, now we're getting divorced. Anything you want from my house, you could take back to your parents' house. Whatever you want, it's yours as a parting gift. That night, she starts telling the, the butler, he was a wealthy man, get my husband drunk. He gets drunk, drunk. After he passes out, what do you want me to do now? Bring him back to my parents' house. Brings him to the parents' house. He wakes up in the morning. Where am I? He sees his ex-wife. What, what, what am I doing here? You're by my parents. Didn't we get divorced? Yeah. But you told me I could take home the most precious thing in this house and the most precious thing I have is you. I want you. He gets all emotional. He starts crying. She's crying. They go back to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. They tell him the story. He said, get married again. I'm going to pray for you. They got married again and they had a child. Now listen to the end of the Midrash. Uma'im basar vadam Omer ish l'rayato If a man tells his wife En li chepetz ba'olam chutz memecha I have nothing in this world other than you and that made them zochel l'hipaket to have a baby. Hashem remembered them because she told her husband I have nobody like you. If we would turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and say, Hashem, en lanu chepetz ba'olam chutz memecha, we have nothing in this world other than you, we only want you. Al achat kama vechama, will we be zochel lehipaked, that Hashem will take us back. We have to turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what do we have? What's, what else is there in this world? I want to do your son. I want to do it the best. I don't want to have any regret in my life. Now is the time. I'm capable. I have the potential. And Be'ezrat Hashem, if we fulfill our potential and everyone does what they're capable of, these days will turn into the greatest days of joy. Amen.